welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobre. Thank you, Father, for your anointing this morning, for the word of God that changes us, rearranges us. So we open your word today, open our hearts. We lift up the body of Christ all over the world. We pray for the persecuted church this morning that you'd protect them. We ask Almighty God that peace would come to our nation. We pray for our leaders, that godly sense would come back to this country. And we ask God as we hear the word of God today that it would do what it's designed to do. Correct us, teach us, instruct us. Give us reproof, Father, that we may be perfect and mature, that we may be fit for all that is ahead of us in this world and in this life that you've graciously given us. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of Hebrews. In the next 30 minutes, we've got a lot to accomplish. We've been in the book of Hebrews. And today I'm going to teach on something that I have lived, something that I continually live on, that God continually teaches me. I've been married to this man for about 33 years. It'll be 34 in January. January 20th is our anniversary. We'll be married 34 years. We brought a blended family together. We have raised four children, and we have 11 grandchildren, one more on the way. My oldest grandson is 20. He's graduating from the Navy. He's getting married, and I could be a great grandmother by next year. Hope not. (laughs) So what I'm saying to you, and I'm giving you those brief credentials just so that you know that What I'm saying this morning is something that I'm continually living, continually learning. And I won't stop learning this until I close my eyes on this earth and I open them in heaven. And I want to teach this morning on prayer. We're in the book of Hebrews and we're in the fourth chapter. And in Hebrews chapter 11, if you'll look with me in verse 14, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Verse 16 is where we're going today. Therefore, let us boldly come before the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. There is a lifetime of learning in that verse, in those verses. A lifetime. This morning I want to speak on the boldness of prayer. The skill of bold praying. I've watched watched the Lord change our lives as husband and wife. Jim and I brought a broken family together. I've watched him take this church from 12 people to what it is today. Thousands upon thousands. I've watched him take children that had gone south. And bring them out of the very fires of hell and bring them into the pulpits of this church and other churches. My children are preaching the gospel. Henny and Miranda have the Rock Church of Temecula. I have watched God do miracles in our lives because of this verse. And if there is one thing I would say to you as a woman of God, I would say in my age now, I would say never stop going before the throne of grace. It is a privileged place. It is a rare place. It's a place that no one else on the planet can go but you and I. You can go see your senator. You can go see your congressman. You may even get to shake the president of the United States' hand. But you and I are the only ones by the blood of Jesus that can get to the throne of God, the highest place in the universe, to receive grace. It's a throne of grace to obtain mercy and receive grace in time of need. So this morning I want to look at some steps to pray in a bold prayer, the skill of bold praying. Bold praying, I found this in my life. There's many times when I've gone to the Lord in prayer. When I was a young believer, I was learning how to pray, and I'm still learning how to pray, so please don't think that I've arrived. But as a young woman of God and newly married and found myself pregnant our first year of marriage and and praying over my children and praying over the situations in our lives, Jim, I married Jim and there wasn't a job. He'd lost his job the day before we got married or 20 days before we got married. So we, we actually had, you know, had to start all over again. So many things were hitting us as as young people, as a young couple. And I didn't know how to walk in faith. I didn't know how to pray the prayer of faith. And so I saw in the word of God and I see in the word of God that there's so many people that prayed, but then there were those that had the word of God and prayed an effective prayer that changed everything. 
The Bible tells us about Elijah, who in the book of James prayed the effective prayer. That he prayed and it didn't rain for three years and he prayed again and it rained. And I don't know about you, but if I think about that for just a minute, I think about, gosh, can you imagine praying and an entire nation stops raining and there's a drought for three years at my prayer. And then I go before the throne of God and I pray again and rain comes after three years. I mean, I don't know about you, but that's not an easy prayer to pray. Either God backs that or he doesn't. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There are prayers that get you nowhere and there are prayers that change your life. There are prayers to get you somewhere and then there are prayers that you stand before the throne of God with boldness and you decree and declare it before the Lord. He hears what you say and he does what you ask. And I want to talk about that kind of prayer today. Coming boldly to the throne of grace. Coming and knowing who you are, which Jim preached about last week. Knowing that we are redeemed and reconciled and restored by the blood of Jesus. Knowing that we go to that throne as a privileged place. He says, come. He doesn't say run. He says, come. But how do I come? And I want to look at this this morning. And I want to look at, through the Old Testament, an example of a man that didn't pray the prayer of faith and through a process of trouble was able to go before the throne of God in a temple and pray the prayer that needed to be prayer to rescue his nation. It was King Hezekiah. Because you and I are going to have trouble. You and I are going to have Kel coming against us. We're going to have a diagnosis that we don't want to hear. We're going to have things happen to our children that we don't want happening to our children. We're going to have economic trouble. We're going to have political unrest. We're going to be a generation in war or out of war, depending on what generation we're born into and what happens. We are going to have trouble in this world. And Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, but... The butts of God are so powerful. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So trouble is not my enemy. Trouble can actually be used as the greatest asset in my life because it trains me to be an overcomer in this world. So I don't have to be afraid of it, but I've got to know what to do when trouble comes and where to go with the trouble and how to go so that the trouble can actually switch around to my good because God causes all things to work for good, to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. All things, even the hell that comes against me, God can take that hell and turn it around. And it's nothing more than a spiritual setup so that I'm an overcomer and trained and taking out giants and learning how to possess the promise. But I got to know how to do this stuff. So I want to talk today about bold praying. So I'm going to say bold praying is, and I'm going to give you four things. We're going to see it out of the book of Hebrews in chapter 4. Bold praying is, number one, guided praying. Guided praying. What do I mean by guided praying? There's all kinds of ways to pray, and there's all kinds of definitions for prayer. Prayers of intercession, prayers of supplication, prayers of repentance. I'm talking about the prayer of faith right now. And there's a time when I need to know what is the will of God, and before I can pray the prayer of faith, I've got to come before God, and I've got to figure out what his will is. I can be like Hezekiah who doesn't know what the will of God is and I can say this is a time of trouble and we're going to see that in a minute or I can come before God in the temple and say now save. And be between the trouble and the prayer of faith, there's a process of learning what the will of God is. Now, I want to talk about that for a minute. Now there's a prayer that says if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask in faith and pray. We can pray God for this. We can pray for the will of God to be known to us. That's a process but then there's a time to come before the throne of God and pray the prayer of faith. And you already know what it is because you've heard the word of God and now you know how to pray it. Now watch this. What is guided praying? True prayer is God's prayers prayed through us. True prayer is God's prayers prayed through us. He's the head, we're the body. He's the high priest. We are the people. He's the head, we're the body. He's not disconnected from us. Jesus Christ is in the heavenly heavens. He's in the third heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. We're on planet earth. God has commissioned us as the body of Christ to bring the kingdom of God to us and through us to this earth. God needs his will and his prayers prayed through us. Now, I can pray, your will be done, your kingdom come, but i got to find out what that will is. Are you hearing me? Romans chapter 8, verse 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. That 
that's us. We don't know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Now, in the Pentecostal church, and we are charismatic Pentecostals, we teach us as praying in other tongues. We pray from man to God and God to man. Praying in the Spirit. Yes, that's a part of it, but that is not all of it. Praying with groanings that can't be uttered. Now, he who makes or he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Who searches the hearts? There's only one. God the Father searches the hearts. He knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints. The Spirit makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. True prayer is God's prayers three, prayed through us. The Holy Spirit teaches us what to pray. He teaches us what to pray. If you want to know how to pray, then begin a journey with the Holy Spirit on that issue that you want to go before God with and let him speak to you. Let him speak to you in the word. Let him speak to you with the promises of God. Let him speak to you in services like this. And the spirit of God will speak to you and quicken something in your heart. He'll begin to say, here's an example of this. This is what you're living. Look at this in the word of God. He'll begin to digest the word of God as you put it in your heart. He'll begin to say, now you can see that promise work for them. You can see that situation happen to them. You can see this is this. Now your situation is in a different time zone and it's different, but it's the same principle. And if it worked for them, it'll work for you. And he begins to guide you and teach you how to pray the will of God over that situation. Case in point is a king named Hezekiah. Hezekiah was 25 years old when he came into the rule of Judah. He reigned for 29 years, and he was a, a Reformation king. He was a good king. He rebuilt the temple. He reestablished the tithe and brought the Levites back in and the, and the priests back in. But Hezekiah inherited a problem from his father. The king of Assyria that had already carted out Israel, the ten tribes of Israel, now was, under, was trying to put the yoke of bondage upon Judah, the two tribes that King Hezekiah was over. And King Hezekiah had already had 46 cities ransacked and destroyed by Sennacherib, King Sennacherib. Already 46 cities had been destroyed. Already 200,000 people had been carted off to Assyria. And now the Rabshanka, which is the general, is at the gate of the walls of Jerusalem. And he is ranting and he is railing. And he is telling Hezekiah, speaking in his native tongue, Hebrew, with all the people on the walls listening, that God cannot save Jerusalem and that the king of Assyria is going to destroy that city. And I'm talking about guided praying. I'm talking about when trouble hits. I'm talking about praying the prayer of faith, bold praying. So Hezekiah hears this bad news. He's already living in it. He's been a righteous king, and now it comes. And he takes that message, and he goes to Isaiah the prophet. So go with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is the prophet of God at this time. And he goes to the prophet Isaiah. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know what to pray. He needs a word from God. There is effective praying. It's praying the will of God. It's knowing the word of God for that situation. Elijah could pray it. He could call down rain, thus saith the Lord. He had the word of God on it. He could stand before the people and decree and declare it. That is praying, and it happened. And then there's others that just don't know what to do, and nothing changes. Now Hezekiah is in that situation. He goes to Isaiah, and he says in Isaiah chapter 37, verse 3, and they said to him, thus says Hezekiah, the messengers that he sent to Isaiah, this day is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy. For the children have come to the birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. Hezekiah doesn't know what to do. 46 cities gone. 200,000 people wiped out. Gone. Now, enemies at the gates. And you know, right now, you and I can have an enemy at our gate. We can have an enemy at the gate of our soul. We can have an enemy at the gate of our family. We can have an enemy at the gate of our children. We can have an enemy at the gate. And Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. But I got to know how to work in the kingdom of God. <laughs> the enemy's at the gate. Just like Hezekiah. And this is what Isaiah says. He says in Isaiah 37, 7. Surely 
I will send a spirit upon him. And he shall hear a rumor, and he shall return to his own land. And I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Now this is the Rabshanka who's railing against God. Hezekiah gets that word. It begins to put faith in his heart. You see, that's what happens with guided praying. You're searching for the word. You don't know what to do. That's why you need to get to the throne of God. That's why you need to get to the house of God. That's why you need to seek out the man of God and the woman of God. You need to have your ears open and your heart open because God wants to put a word in your heart. He wants to put a word in your soul because he wants you to stand before the throne of grace and begin to pray the prayer of God. But you can't do it if you don't know how to pray it. So now Hezekiah hears the word of the Lord. So step two, number one is guided praying. Hear the word and get the word on it. Now step two, bold praying. Praying the prayer of faith. I'm going to have to now go before the Lord and bold praying is praying in faith. Praying in faith. We have so much teaching on this, but hear the word of God. Mark 11, 22 through 24. Show and tell time Jesus has one week left on the earth. He has cursed the fig tree. The disciples have seen that fig tree wither and die in front of them. A tree fully grown to suddenly dead. And Jesus says, it's a show and tell, it's a lesson. Children, let me show you the kingdom. Let me show you what you're inheriting. Let me show you what the new birth is going to bring you. Let me show you what the new covenant the covenant of God, that I'm going to be the high priest of your confession. And you're going to have a throne that you can finally get to. And you're going to be able to stand before this throne. And you're going to be able to speak to that mountain. And you're going to be able to pray the prayer of faith. And like this fig tree, it will have to obey you. So Jesus says in Mark chapter 11. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Because they looked at that fig tree. For assuredly I say to you. For assuredly, I say to you, Rock Church, 21st century Christians, the King of glory speaking to us directly. For assuredly, I say to you, Church of the living God on planet Earth. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever, not apostles and prophets and pastors, whoever, that's every person in this building, everyone listening to my voice online, all over the earth, the whoever's of God, that's the men and the women of God that are born of the Spirit of God, are the whoever's, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things that he says will be done, he'll have whatever he says, verse 24, therefore, the prayer of faith, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray. Whatever things you ask when you pray. That's why when I go to God to ask for something, if it's not wisdom, if it's not the will of God on a situation, which is the seeking part, the guiding part, now I've got it. Whatever you ask when you pray, now I've got it. Believe that you shall receive it. Believe that those things... Believe that you receive them, and you will have them. The prayer of faith. There's a time to seek, and there's a time to ask. There's a time to seek, and there's a time to ask. There's a time to seek, and there's a time to ask. When you know the will of God, when you know what God's will is on that situation, now it's time to pray the prayer of faith. And whatever things you ask, they're going to be done for you. Hezekiah gets a word from Isaiah. Hezekiah is told the Rabshanka is going to be destroyed. But here's what happens in chapter 37. We're talking about bold prayer, guided prayer. Hezekiah gets the word from Elisha, from Isaiah, I'm sorry, Isaiah. He hears that God's going to send a, a blast, a spirit to the Rabshanka. He's going to go back to his country. And he's going to die. Well, that happens. But then guess what? The king of Assyria, Sennacherib, sends letters and another embassy. And he says, hey, what the Rabshanka said, I'm going to do. I'm going to take you out. Who do you think you are, Hezekiah? Who do you think Jerusalem is that you can stand against me, the king of Assyria, when I have wiped out all the nations around you and all their gods. Their gods have not been able to stand before me, and your God will not be able to stand before me. Now Hezekiah, who didn't know how to pray, now he's got the letter. You see, the enemy is not going to quit. He's going to come to your gate. 
He's going to rail and he's going to rant. He may go away for a season, but he will come back. So now what are you going to do? Now you know the word of the Lord. So this is what Hezekiah does. I'm talking about praying in faith. Bold prayer knows that what they are praying is the will of God because this is what Isaiah does in Isaiah chapter 37. I'm going to read five verses. I'm going to put one on the overhead, so listen to what Isaiah prayers, prays. I said Isaiah. Hezekiah, King Hezekiah. Isaiah is the prophet. Hezekiah is the king. Hezekiah prays to the Lord saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear all the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. For truly, Lord, the king of Assyria has laid waste all the nations and their lands. I'm not putting my head in the sand, God. This thing is really at the gate. But here's the deal. Here's the prayer of faith. And they have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, woods and stone. Therefore, they are destroyed. Now, here's the prayer. Verse 20. Now, therefore, O Lord, our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord, you alone. He didn't know what to pray before. He said, this is a terrible time, a time of trouble, a time when you can't bring to the birth. The enemy's at the gate. God sends Elijah, here's the word of the Lord. I'm going to send a spirit. I'm going to take that rap shank. I'm going to get him out of your way. But here comes the letter. It's not over. The enemy's still there. Now he takes that letter and he goes to the temple of God. He goes to the throne of God. He goes to the earth place. He goes to where God's altar is. He goes to the house of God. You and I are commanded to go to the throne of God. I don't even have to come to church to pray. I can pray in my closet at home. I can pray in my car. I can pray in the middle of nowhere. I don't have to search and find a building. I am the building. I am the temple. And I can kneel and I can spread the letter out before the Lord and I can say, Lord, here's what the enemy me is saying, Lord, here's what you are. Save, oh Lord. You see, that's the prayer of faith. Now you know what to pray. 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, whatever we ask, Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Did you hear what John said to the church? Bold praying is guided praying. That's why it's so important to find the will of God in the word, in a word from God. And it better, better, better be confirmed by the word of the Lord in this book because this book is true. Not some prophecy somebody says. If it doesn't get confirmed by that, it's not God. It's foolishness. It'll fall to the ground. But guided prayer is praying the prayers of God, taking time to find out, taking time to be afraid, taking time to go through the process of getting faith in your heart. Then when you get that faith in your heart now, Jesus said, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them. You see, when I ask for that kind of thing, I better pray the prayer of faith. I got to believe that I've received. I got to believe that God has heard me. I got to believe that I've prayed the word of God. I got to have the assurance. I just can't hope it's out there somewhere. That's not the prayer of faith. That's not the prayer that changed my children. That's not the prayer that snatched them out of hell. That's not the prayer that takes broke people and busted people people and brings them into prosperity that's not the prayer that puts a right mind and a mind that's going south that's not the prayer that delivers out of drug abuse that's not the prayer that saves a marriage the prayer that does that is the prayer of faith know what the will of God is and then you pray it and you believe it until you can believe it don't pray it you're still seeking you're still seeking that's not a bad place to be, but that's not where you need to be to change. Now, you prayed the prayer of faith, and he says very directly, if I know God hears me, I know I have the things I've asked for. If that's not assurance and confidence, I don't know what is. So Isaiah is taught prayers from God. 
And he says to Hezekiah, go and tell Hezekiah this. Now he spread this thing out before the Lord in the temple. He's prayed the prayer of faith. God answers him. God answers Hezekiah. In chapter 37, he says, and I don't have this on the overhead, but he says, then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, thus says the Lord, don't you love the conversation? God will answer you. That's why I go to the Word. That's why I take my Bible with me when I pray. Because I don't have Isaiah the prophet. I don't need him. I've got Jesus, my high priest, who's in the heavens. He's already written it down. All I have to do is go to the Word, and the Spirit of God will quicken that Word to my heart. He'll quicken that confidence to me. He'll give me the Word of the Lord that I need when I prayed the prayer of faith. And all hell's coming against me now because between the amen and the hallelujah, there's going to be a walk of faith. So God gives Isaiah a word. This is what he says. Then Isaiah, son of Amos, verse 21, says to Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, because you have prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria. This is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, which is Judah, has despised you, speaking of King Sennacherib, laughed you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head behind your back. Oh, wicked king. Oh, Satan. Oh, Satan. You're railing at me and telling me you're taking out my children. You're railing at me and telling me you're taking out my marriage. You're railing at me and telling me you're taking out our economics. You're railing at me and telling me you're taking out my nation, my state, my people, my city. Oh, I don't think so. Because you haven't come against me, you've come against the living God. You've come against the living God. Just as Sennacherib wasn't coming against Hezekiah, he was coming against the God of heaven. Because Hezekiah was his son. He was in covenant with God. He was the king of Judah. How much more shall the body of Christ, who is bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, when the enemy rails against our children, our marriages, our church, our city, our jobs, our destiny, that's... Satan coming against God, coming against Jesus, because you come against Jesus when you come against me. And I better know that. I better know that because I'm going to have to have guided prayer. I'm going to have to pray the prayer of faith. And number three, I'm going to have to persist in this thing. Because between the amen, which is God, I believe it, I receive it. And the hallelujah, I actually physically have it in my life. There is a walk of faith. This thing doesn't just happen. It doesn't just get over like that. Sometimes it takes years for a prayer to get answered. Sometimes it's moments. The answer is there. God says it's yours. God says it's yours, child. But the manifestation of that may take a while. And between the amen, I believe I receive it. And the hallelujah, I got it. There is a journey of faith, and you are going to need some things in the arsenal of that journey, which is mercy and grace to help in a time of need. God says you are going to have to have guided praying. You're going to have to pray the prayer of faith. Now, child, bold praying is persistent. It's not going to quit. It's not going to have a meltdown. It's not going to absolutely go backward and say, ah, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to the house of God anymore. I'm not believing God anymore. Nothing's happened. Nothing's changed. It's all the same. It's getting worse. No. The prayer of faith, bold praying, knows that at the throne of God, he says, run to the throne. It's a throne of grace. God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. Grace, God's power in me to do what his truth demands of me. When I need to change, when I need to rearrange, when I need to drop something, when I need to take sin out of my life, there's the throne of grace that I'm to run to and not from. When there's trouble, I'm not to run from God, I'm to run to him. And the enemy wants to do everything he can to just get us away, take us off track. But between the amen and the hallelujah, God says, you, you be persistent. Don't you quit. Don't you quit. Hezekiah gets a word. Hebrews 10, 36 says, for you have need of endurance. You have need of endurance, church. Oh, put your weapons on. For after you have done the will of God, you're not out of the will of God. All hell's coming against you, that's all. You pray for something, one to get healed and to get worse. You pray for your finances and you lose your job. But God, I prayed the prayer of faith. I know, I know this is your will. I know it, I know it, I know it. He will do everything he can to get your knower off your knowing. 
He will do everything he can to get your knower, your faith, off your knowing, off the promise of God. That's the amen, but there's a journey to the hallelujah. Hezekiah had to endure Sennacherib coming with his army to the walls of Jerusalem. He didn't get out of the battle. He had to endure the time that it took for that king to go from Assyria all the way to Jerusalem. It wasn't like, oh, Rabshakeh is dead and the king of Assyria is destroyed. No, the king of Assyria came with his armies. But Hezekiah had a knower and a word from God. And he knew that God was going to deliver them. And he had to be persistent. Come boldly to the throne to receive mercy. To actually, the word is obtain mercy. You have to accept it and you have to take it. God's got it for us, but I can't get it if I'm not at the throne. I can't get it because that's where it is. It's at the throne. It's not watching television. It's not worrying. It's not talking to all my friends. It's not even going to church to do my good works. It's at the throne. You can be at the throne right here sitting in this sanctuary right now. Your heart is hearing the word of God. You're at the throne of God. But you got to be at the throne to obtain mercy. you got to receive it and you got to take it and say, God, I don't deserve it. But I'm taking this because it's mine because you said I could have it. And I don't care what Sennacherib says. You said he's not going to take over. He's not taking this city. So then... Not only do you have to persist, do I have to persist, but last one, and I'll quit with this. I have to declare the outcome. Between the amen and the hallelujah and the prayer of faith and boldly coming before the Lord, i got to declare the outcome. i got to say something. Everything has ears. Everything has ears. I learned this a long time ago. Moses spoke to the rock and it gave water. Joshua spoke to the walls. They shouted and the walls came down. Jesus spoke to the storm and it quieted. Jesus spoke to the fig tree and it obeyed him. Everything has ears, material and immaterial. Walls have no life. Trees have no soul, but they have ears. Storms and tornadoes and hurricanes, they have nothing that you can see, but they had an ear to hear. Peace be still when Jesus calmed the storm. Everything has ears. Everything. And God says, now that you have found my word, guided praying, now that you have stepped into my throne and prayed the prayer of faith, you have an assurance that I've prayed the will of God. You know that I've heard you. And if I hear you, child, you got it. If I hear you, you got it. I'm not going to hear your foolishness, but if I hear your prayer of faith, if you pray the prayer of God in this situation, the will of God in this situation, be assured, Debbie Cobray, that I have heard you. It is my will to bring this on the earth through you and your life and your family. It shall be done. But between the amen and the hallelujah, I better have endurance. And now I better decree and declare with authority what God says is already mine. Last verse. Isaiah 37, 36, and the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were corpses all dead. One angel wiped out 185,000 warriors. From a man that didn't know what to do, there's trouble. This is a day of blasphemy. The children have come, but they can't be brought to the birth. I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to do. Isaiah, I need a word from you. To the word of the Lord coming to Hezekiah, guided prayer. To Hezekiah taking that letter from Sennacherib, that threat, the enemy's at the gate, it's real. Going before God, the throne of God on the earth, the temple, laying it out before the Lord and saying, save, O oh Lord. The prayer of faith. To having be to having to be between the amen and the hallelujah, having to wait as that army does come. It does come. It did come. It was at the gate again. The enemy's still at the gate. It's at the gate. I prayed the prayer of faith. I am persisting, but it's at the gate. And one day, one angel goes out, and those 185,000 warriors are all dead. One angel. One angel. You have, and I have, 
the king of glory that has gone through the third heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, that has purchased and paid for every promise of God, has washed me in his blood, has redeemed me back to the Father, has restored me and reconciled me. I have the kingdom of God at my beck and call. I have the resources of heaven at my life, and I'm going to be afraid. I'm not going to run to the throne of grace when I mess up God. What, you don't know? Forgive me. There is healing and help and forgiveness at the throne. Have you messed up today? Well, then you're in the right place because now you can get right with God. He brought you here not to bash you, not to send you to hell, but he brought you here to save you. And guess what? You'll mess up again. And you'll mess up again, and you'll mess up again. And there's mercy at this throne of grace. There's forgiveness and healing and help. There's grace. There's a power of God to do whatever you need done in your life to get you from the amen to the hallelujah. So, wrapping this up. The skill of bold praying. Come boldly. Find out as well. Guided Prayer is bold prayer. Find out first. Take the time to seek the Lord. Two, pray in faith. Once you find it, get to the throne. And when you, pull, and when you pray, Jesus says, believe that you receive. Don't pray the prayer of faith until you believe you received it because it's not the prayer yet. When you've prayed that, persist, for you have need of endurance, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promises. There will be a journey from the amen to the hallelujah. And in that journey, declare with the authority of heaven behind you, in the name of Jesus, what God says he will do. And if God can send one angel to Hezekiah, how many can he send for you? You've been so good today. It's an amazing thing being a child of God, being a Christian. It's not a religion, it's a relationship. And one day I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to give an account of what I did with this time right now. And God brought you here today for a specific reason and a purpose. And I want to tell you what that is. But before I tell you, let me ask you a question. If you, with every good intention, walked out those doors today and through no fault of your own, because life is Short and life is fragile. Through no fault of your own, you died. Would you open your eyes in heaven? Would you open your eyes in hell? What would happen? And if you're thinking right now, I hope I'd open my eyes in heaven. I think I would. I'm a good person. Good people go to heaven. I've, I've changed a lot of things and I'm here today and I think I'd I'd go because I'm good. I have to talk to you because you don't think your way into heaven, you don't hope your way into heaven, and you don't behave your way into heaven. There's only one way to God's heaven, only one way, and God said you must be born again. He wrote the book. By the way, that story, that history, on King Hezekiah, there are cylinders, clay cylinders with this story on them in the Museum of Natural History in Britain and in Chicago. This wasn't a story. This was an event, and it's written in the earth. This book is true from the beginning to the end. From Genesis to Revelation, this book is true. And God says you must be born again. And my culture tells me good people go to heaven. Good people can probably work their way to heaven, but God doesn't say that. World religions have all of these paths and all of these thoughts. There's universalism. There's all kinds of world religions that tell you this is how you do it. You work your way to it. But God never said you can work your way to me. There's no way you can get to me. God said your goodness is like a filthy rag before me. You can compare yourself to each other and you may look good, but the standard isn't each other. The standard is me. And in comparison to God's perfection and goodness, I will always, always lose and fall short. The Lord knew that. From the foundation of the world, he knew that man could not save himself. So he became man. 
to save us because we couldn't get to him. He came to us. You must be born again. What does that mean, born again? What a mockery our culture has done to this term. Our media has done an excellent job of slandering the truth. But Jesus explained what born again was to a very, very wise man, a rabbi named Nicodemus in Jerusalem, who was so afraid that he came to Jerusalem at night and not during the day for fear of the Jews. He's a celebrity rabbi. Everybody knew who he was. He said, Jesus, how do I get to heaven? And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you're a teacher of the law and you don't know? Nicodemus, what is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. You must be born again. And Nicodemus was confused. He said, I can't climb into my mother's womb. And Jesus said, look at the wind. You can't see it, but you can tell where it's been. Even so was everyone born of the spirit. God is a spirit. Nicodemus, you have a human spirit. It's disconnected by sin. Nicodemus, that, that spirit must be born again. And this is how Nicodemus, you can read this in John, the third chapter. I'm going to a cross. You can't get to me, so I've come to you. I have wrapped myself in flesh. I am God, but I am also man. And Nicodemus, I'm going to lay my life down because I'm the only one that can pay for your sin. I'm the only one that can be the sacrifice. I'm the only one that can take your sin and the sin of the world and Debbie Cobra and everybody that's in this building and every person that will ever live. I'm the only one that is qualified to take on that sin and be the sacrifice. Nicodemus, I'm laying my life down and I'll pick it back up. And if you look at that cross and if you'll surrender your heart and your life to me and let me be Savior and Lord, you'll be born again. I'll take you out of the kingdom of darkness and I'll bring you back to the Father. So it's not what we have in our heads. It's what we've done with our hearts. All of our behavior, all of our hoping, all of our thinking isn't going to do anything. It's what we've done when we look at the cross. It's what decision we make when we gaze at that cross and have to come to a decision. Because he's either true or he's a liar. He's either all God and all man or he is a liar. But he's not a liar. He raised from the dead. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He loves you so much he couldn't live without you. And now he's asking, what are you going to do when you look at my cross? Are you going to surrender your heart and your life to me? Or are you going to walk away from this place? He brought you here today to change destinies. He brought you here today because he didn't make you for hell. He made you for heaven. Some of you are saying, well, I just can't trust myself. No, you can't trust you. You're going to screw up again, but you can trust him. He can take you from the inside and change you. He took this ex-druggie and everything else. Now I'm an old grandmother. So many years ago in another life, he changed me. I couldn't change me, but he did. You can't save yourself, but he can. All over this auditorium, what have you done when you look at the cross? Have you allowed him to be Savior and Lord of your life, or have you been a little in and a little out, up and down, here today, gone tomorrow? Like every American, so many, I know Jesus, I know him in my head, but I have not let him be Lord of my heart. What have you done with the cross? And today he brought you here to look at that cross and say, what are you going to do? Are you going to surrender your heart and your life to me? Or are you going to let me be your Savior? Just like I have to go to the throne and I have to obtain mercy. I have to accept it and receive it. He's already given it, but I have to take it. He's already given you everything you're ever going to need. But you're going to have to receive it today. Have you been running from God instead of to him? I'm talking to you. Have you served God, but you've backslidden? And oh, God, you just hate yourself, hate everything you're doing. Don't trust yourself. I'm so talking to you. It's time to get right and let him give you the power to change. Have you been a good person better than all ever dream of being? Went to church, believe that Jesus is the son of God, so does the devil. But you've never surrendered your heart and your life to him, letting him be Savior and Lord. I'm talking to you. All over this auditorium with heads up and eyes open, we're going to do this together. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. You're going to say, I don't want to, I don't want to. What are you going to do now? I said, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to ask you to get right with God. You're going to say, oh, I'm going to be embarrassed. Well, oh, well, let's get over that, shall we? You're going to be very embarrassed before the throne of God. You're going to be in hell, and you would raise anything to get out of hell. Don't let one moment of discomfort stop you from doing what God wants you to do today, why he brought you here. I'm going to count to three, and I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. We are going to do this together. Are you ready? One, 
two, three. Let me see your hands all over. I see that hand. I see that hand. Raise them high. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Raise them high. Wave them at me. Boy, I need my glasses. Nine. I see that hand. Listen, because of time, I could count all day long. I want you to do this with me. We're going to sing this song. If you raised your hand or if you didn't, and you should have, grab what you brought to church with you and grab somebody if you need to. Somebody, if somebody brought you, you come with them. Come down. Let's get right with God today. We're going to stand and sing this song. If you raised your hand, collect your stuff, meet me at this altar. If you didn't raise your hand, it is not too late. It's time to come home and get right with God. Won't you come? Just quickly come, quickly come. You are. Quickly come. Oh, and hear the Spirit get out of your seats and get down here. God loves us. Come, just He's not mad at us. He's the only one that can change us. He's the only one that has the answer. He's the only one. He made you. He loves you. He's not mad at you, but he needs you to make a decision for him. He can't make it for you. This is our part. He's already done his. Quickly come, quickly come, quickly come. We'll wait for you. We'll wait. Quickly come. They're still coming. They're still coming. You're wondering if you should. Yes. Yes, you should. Yes, you should. God's pleading with your heart. I know there's more of you in here, but because of time, I'm not going to prolong this. But you come back. You pray this prayer. Join us in the front. Justin wrote us a letter. Justin said, I was in your service on Sunday. I should have come down when you gave the altar call, Pastor Jim, but I didn't. The next day I was in a shootout and I killed a cop and now I'm in prison for life. My girlfriend brought me and she wanted me to come, but I wouldn't come. Now I'll never marry the woman I love and I'll never have the family I dreamed of. I'm in prison for life, but I'm a Christian and I'm serving God, but pray for me. See, we don't know who's sitting in this auditorium, and you don't know what tomorrow is. But God does, and he brought you here today. And you need to get down here quickly. God loves you, but he will not spoon feed you and force salvation down your throat. This is something you have to decide and you have to choose. Is there anybody else in this auditorium? They're still coming. I'm going to give you just a moment. Just a moment. Come quickly. Come quickly. Come quickly. Come quickly. There's at least 10 more of you that need to come. You're not going to a funeral. You're going to heaven. So that deserves a smile. A big smile. Well done. This is Pastor Dave. We're going to pray with you. We're going to take you into a room that's private. And we're going to pray with you and we're going to talk to you about a few things. We've got a spiritual personal training program. Give us a year in this church. You got saved here. This is where God wants you to be. Let us help you grow in the Lord. Let us help you get strong. When I had babies, I didn't leave them in the hospital. I brought them home and I loved them and I took care of them. Let us be a family to you. You're not joining the church. You're saying yes to Jesus. So if you'll make a left turn. This is Pastor Dave. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful.